second week of our three week webinar series. So Flop Consult, um, microbiology webinars for the pharmaceutical industry. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, so last week, Tuesday, we had uh, the previous webinar, the first webinar uh, in which Ulrich Eichmanns from uh, Pharma Media, Dr. Muller, he talked to us about the latest development in uh, nutrient media that they develop at PMM. Normally by now, everyone that attended that webinar or that registered at least should have received the link to the recording of the previous webinar. If not, or if you would like to uh, get the recording uh, to last week's webinar, please just send us an email uh, at info at labconsults.be and we will send a link to the recording to you. Um, so next week, Tuesday, is an, another webinar, is the third and final webinar in our series. And then we have uh, Dr. Enrico Tatti from Biolog, a US-based company. He will talk to us about the Biolog technology that can be used for uh, identification of your environmental isolates. And this week, we have uh, Andre Inatsenka. He's uh, the business manager Europe for a company called Microbiologics. And Andre will talk to us about growth promotion testing, um, strain management, so the management of the environmental isolates that you find in your production facilities, and the microbiologics products that are developed to support uh, these tasks. Um, microbiologics is a US-based company. It's, uh, it was founded in 1971 in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And they are the main one of the main manufacturers of ready-to-use microorganisms for QC testing. Um, so QC testing in the pharmaceutical industry, in the clinical industry, and also in food industry. Um, Microbiologics has a very diverse range of um, approximately 900 or over 900 ATCC reference strains that are available in different product formats. So both uh, quantitative or qualitative uh, product formats. Andre will tell you all about these. Um, besides the QC uh, strains itself, Microbiologics also offers a range of uh, services to manage your environmental isolates. Um, this range is basically from uh, only identification and, and characterization of your isolates also preservation and storage of the isolates that you send them, and um, even also manufacturing of ready-to-use QC formats of your own strain that you ship to uh, microbiologics. Obviously, this all happens in uh, complete confidentiality. Um, but again, about this, Andre will tell you a lot more in his presentation. So our speaker today, Andre, is, um, is very experienced. He has over 15 years of experience in the microbiology industry. He worked in different roles, um, ranging from marketing to technical sales. Um, he spent many years working for a company called Biomerieu, which most of you probably know. He worked in the US for Biomerieu, and then he moved back to Europe to work for, uh, for Kiagen, uh, Kiagen for a couple of years. And in 2019, he joined uh, Microbiologics as the business manager for Europe, so his current role. So and now today he's here to talk to us um, about um, yeah growth promotion testing and envir environmental monitoring in general. Uh, if you will have any questions um, during the webinar, please just type them in the chat box. And after the presentation of Andre, we will we will go over the different questions that came up and discuss them. So I think that's it from my part. So. Uh, Andre, please uh, go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you, Sam. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, good morning. Again, my name is Andre Ignatenka, um, and I'm the area business manager at Microbiologics. I would like to thank all of you for joining this webinar today and also our partner, Love Consult, for organizing it. As Sam mentioned, the topic of my presentation today is growth promotion testing and environmental monitoring in pharma. A few words about the agenda of this webinar. In today's presentation, I would like to cover the following topics. Growth promotion test, or GPT, environmental monitoring, 
and objectionable microorganisms? And finally, how microbiologics can help with all of this? First, starting with a quick introduction of our partner Lab Consult. I'm not going to say a lot here because I'm sure you, you know them very well. In total, Lab Consult has over 25 years of experience in the field. They offer a wide range of highly innovative lab equipment and services, and they're also ISO 9001 certified company. Lab Consult has been our trusted partner in Belgium for five years now, and they're doing fantastic jobs supplying the products of microbiologics and supporting our customers in Belgium. So thanks a lot for that. Now, moving straight to our first point, growth promotion testing. What is GPT, why we need GPT, and how we do it? The main purpose of the growth promotion test is to determine the suitability of culture media. In other words, if the tested media indeed can be used for its purposes. Also to verify the batch-to-batch -batch consistency, to eliminate any variations or problems between different batches of media. How do we do it? The medium is challenged with a small number of microorganisms to assure its nutrition properties. The test is described in different chapters for sterile and non-sterile products, and pharmacopoeia is the main source here. Normally, these requirements are harmonized between the main standards, European pharmacopoeia, US pharmacopoeia, and Japanese pharmacopoeia. These days, Growth motion testing really plays the key role in the quality control process. And of course, the main goal here is to avoid false negative results in testing that potentially lead to widespread recalls, sickness, or even death. On this graph, the data is taken from American Pharmaceutical Review. You can see the total number of recalls in pharma industry in the US per year. You can see the numbers are not really decreasing with the time, despite all the efforts. In fact, there were even more recalls in the recent years. All this suggests that quality control in microbiology, including growth promotion testing, is extremely important and needs to be given our full attention. Let's speak a bit more about uh, the growth promotion testing and the acceptance criteria used to evaluate the results of GPT. Here are the main five rules of growth promotion testing. First, test each new batch of media. What is considered a batch? On commercially prepared plate media, you can always find a lot number. However, if you are still making your, your own media in the lab, every time you cook the media, it's considered a new batch. Then you inoculate media with 10 to 100 CFU. Organisms should be five passages or less from the reference culture. This is very important. Organisms listed in the standards below, uh, in, in the standards followed, where, whether it's USP or EP, always follow the standards and use the required strains of microorganisms. And finally, less than a factor of two between two batches. And we will see how this works in a minute. So how do we accept or reject the results of testing? We should compare a number of colonies on previously approved medium to the number of colonies on new medium batch. The number must be within the factor of two. For example, if we inoculated, we inoculated previously approved lot and counted 40 colonies on the plate. In parallel, we have also inoculated the new batch of medium. To be within a factor of two, we must grow between 20 and 80 colonies. And this is the actual citation to the chapter in pharmacopoeia regarding the factor of two. To be precise, it is the chapter USP 61 or European Pharmacopoeia 2.6.12, paragraph growth promotion of the media. It says for solid media growth obtained must not differ by a factor greater than two from the calculated value for a standardized inoculum. So let's take a look at uh, this small exercise. We have some kind of inoculum with a theoretical concentration of 70 CFU. We inoculate two plates of culture media to do our growth promotion testing. 
On the previously approved batch of media, we counted 22 colonies. And on the new batch of culture media, we counted 32 CFU. Is this result acceptable? Can we say that we're okay to use the new batch of culture media or not? Yes, in this case, we can say that because it is within the factor of two. When we're testing broad or selective media, um, in this case, we should use different criteria. There is no factor two. We only compare results to the previously approved batch of culture media. No strict requirements was uh, deliberately given in this chapter because the test is qualitative, not quantitative. You can define the com compare, um, comparability criteria yourself. For example, colony size um, at the shortest incubation time prescribed. So in this case, we can say the method of testing and result evaluation is a bit subjective. Let's take a look at this one. Here we compare turbidity in the new medium to turbidity in the previously approved medium. Again, acceptance criteria is different in this case. Turbidity should be comparable. And what comparable is each user defines on case by case basis. At the same time, we should check the control plates on TSA. We count colonies on non-selective agar and there should be less uh, than 100 CFU. That's our equal. The bottom line, it's always best to test in parallel previously approved batch and the new batch of media. In this case, the only variable is the culture media. If something didn't work out, you have only lost two plates of TSA, but you're in a good position for faster troubleshooting in um, case of any issue. Can I use MAV provided by the supplier for my GPT. Sometimes we get this question from customers. Um, if they can use the you know, mean assay value provided by the supplier of the strain to do the growth promotion testing. The answer is yes, you can, but it's not recommended. Manufacturers of culture media and reference strains have different conditions compared to your lab. It does not um, represent your conditions, hence there is a risk of misinterpretation. Think about it, culture media manufacturer, they have their own strains, uh, the, their own incubator technician technique. Uh, for strain manufacturer, it's the same. Uh, culture media, different incubator, different technician technique. MAV is provided as an indication to prove compliance with USP, you know, to show that we're less than 100 CFU in inoculum, but it's it's only serves as the indication purpose. At Microbiologics, we believe that when it comes to growth promotion testing, it is always better to do a side-by-side -side testing. In this case, we eliminate pretty much all the variables, such as temperature, atmosphere, operator, method, incubation time, and others. The only variable that remains is the culture media. In this case, the test is much more objective than comparison with MAV provided by the manufacturer, for example. If you currently do keep your strains in-house or plan on doing so, you should understand there are some risks associated with it and definitely an additional cost. First is time. Imagine what you could accomplish with the time currently spent on culture preparation and maintenance. Secondly, it's risk. It's a risk of cross-contamination, mutation, and loss of strains due to equipment malfunction. And third is inconsistency. Tedious manual methods of preparing inoculums to a specific concentration are frequently subject to error resulting in repeat the repeating the tests. Also, uh, validation. These are resource uh, absorbing validations must be performed for each strain's pre preservation method, colony counting method and shelf life expectancy. And finally, responsibility. In case of failure, the lab will be responsible and will have to investigate. Curative actions will always be more time consuming and costly than using ready to use product. 
Microbiologists can help. Uh, this is where we can really help you with uh, our pharma products, specifically designed for GPT and other applications. Perhaps you had already tried or even using some of them. If not yet, but you would like to know more about it or to give it a try, please contact our distributor lab consultant and they will be happy to help you out. You will be surprised by the ease of use of these products, the quality of your results, and how much time and effort they could save in your laboratory. In this section, we will uh, speak a little bit about environmental monitoring, why it is important, and how it helps us avoid warning letters or product recalls. Objectionable microorganisms. When we speak about environmental monitoring, automatically we speak about objectionable microorganisms. But what are these? These are the organisms that can cause illness, injury, or harm with use of the product, affect product stability, affect container closure system, affect analytical testing, affect active ingredient. They might produce odors, flavors, or undesirable, undesirable metabolites potential to grow and exceed specifications. Um, sometimes they're high virulence or low uh, infection dose, resist to antimicrobial therapy. And of course, this means we have to test for their presence on different steps of the process. Which regulations to follow? There are different regulations depending on the country, but in most European countries, the main one to follow is, uh, in this case, is European Pharmacopoeia, chapter 5.1.4, for microbiological quality of non-sterile pharmaceutical preparations and substances for pharmaceutical use. There is a similar chapter in the US Pharmacopoeia as well. It's chapter 1111 in USP, microbiological examination of non-sterile products acceptance criteria for pharmaceutical preparations and substances for pharmaceutical use. <clears throat> Table one includes a list of uh, specified microorganisms for which acceptance criteria are set. The list is not necessarily exhaustive and for a given preparation, it may be necessary to test for other microorganisms depending on the nature of the um, starting materials and the manufacturing process. This is more an example than the rule. Speaking of the risk, there are a few factors that will define the level of risk. Route of administration, the isolate might be a pathogen. It may affect the product. It could be an environmental contaminant. And on the diagram here, you can see the number of recalls split by the organism type. Clearly, we can see the number one here causing more recalls is buccal dereciation, around 34% of all the product recalls. And then uh, you have a couple of other groups, yeast and moles, 21%, pseudomonas, 15%, enterobacteria CA, 11%, and others. The risk depends on several factors. And finding an objectionable organism depends on good isolation techniques, good identification capabilities, trending and tracking capabilities, reviewing of available data. If I find one objectionable, what should I do? Well, first you isolate it, you grow a pure culture of it, characterize it, and then determine the risk to consumer and the product. And on this slide, you can see um, hierarchy of the risk. Uh, from the left to the right, uh, the risk increases. So if we start with lower risk, you can see products like oral tablets, um, liquid filled capsules, uh, other oral liquids. Um, and then as you go more to Otics, nasal sprays, aerosols, and dry powder inhalants, the risk increases. So if you're um, dealing with uh, higher risk products, then it makes even more sense 
uh, to keep an eye on objectionable organisms and be careful with, um, you know, with, with testing and making sure that we are free of any uh, potential contaminants during all the steps of the process. The data on this slide is not super fresh. It contains information on the recalls recorded by the FDA from 2004 to 2011. In total, there were 642 microbiological recalls. If we are trying to split all products in two big groups, sterile and non-sterile, we will see that almost 80% of the recalls were associated with sterile products. If we look by type on the right diagram, we will see that 65% of recalls were associated with medical devices, 15% with pharmaceuticals, 11% with over-the-counter drugs, and a bit less with the others. Here you can see um, the three different sections in the FDA's Code of Federal Regulations that are referring to the objectionable organisms and that there should be an adequate testing in place to make sure we are able to detect those objectionable organisms. So it's, um, you can see different citation on different chapters and they're all talking specifically about uh, objectionable organisms. So clearly there's a high level of importance uh, from the FDA standpoint. How to keep products safe from objectionable organisms the first point is a necessity to maintain good manufacturer practices, appropriate and necessary training for people, make sure there is water system that meets all the requirements, correct procedures are used across the plant, for example, the use of disinfectants, correct processes like pest control, and the right practices in place like the environmental monitoring program. Another important point is the regular testing of your final products, such as microbial enumeration test and test for specified microorganisms. How to check products for presence of objectionable organisms? Again, first of all, test the environment, monitor environment, identify suspicious organisms on agar plates, test products for environmental organisms, and the second point, again, test your final products for objectionable organisms and perform the identification. Here's the list of some chapters in the USP describing procedures and the requirements when it comes to testing the environmental isolates. Disinfectant qualification, USP 1116, growth promotion testing, three chapters on that, validation of uh, neutralization methods, suitability testing, antimicrobial effectiveness testing, water for pharmaceutical purposes, and aseptic processing environments. You all know that there are certain issues or difficulties when we work with our environmental isolates. Once an environmental isolate is cultured, it loses its wild type trait. Also, we have to maintain the organism within five passages. Preparation of suspension can be challenging if specific concentration is needed. We may miss our target concentration and we will not know it until the test is complete. We may need to refrigerate suspension for several days, which also introduces some risks. How many environmental strains should we consider? This is a good question. From our experience, between two and six is the most frequent. Below are some examples uh, for water organisms, can be Methylobacterium, Ralstonia, for human flora, it's usually Micrococcus, Staphylococcus. Uh, for a filamentous fungi, can, can be Cladosporium, um, Zygosaccharomyces, um, there are some critical strains as well, like Burkhildere cepacea, Bacillus cereus. For how long we should keep those strains, um, you know, if there is no detection after one year, it does not guarantee it will not occur again. 
This is why we store them microbiologics for at least four years or even longer if needed. What kind of strains we should consider depends on several factors. The activity of the pharma company, the type of product manufactured, in terms of the primary source of the strain, selection depends on criticality. It can be from water supplies, from operators, raw materials, finished products, air containers, pests. These are just some examples. In the end, it's you who decides this. And here we have some examples of objectionable organisms. Uh, for instance, Burkhalderia cepacea can be usually found in nasal sprays, creams, lotions, oils, waters, vibes as well. Uh, if it's yeast and molds, can be found in air and surfaces, also in oral suspensions, swabs and tablets, wipes, bacillus cereus, alcohol wipes and swabs. There were some uh, very big and bad recalls in the U.S., um, that caused some death um, because, you know, there was bacillus series found in alcohol wipes years ago. Um, also antibiotics, surfaces, um, pseudomonas can be in hand sanitizer, water, etc. cetera. Um, so again, this is just uh, an example. Of course, there is no, there's always an exception to, to each rule and uh, the risk assessment has to be performed in uh, each laboratory and each manufacturing site. Some more examples um, of objectionable organisms. Again, you can see that on the diagram that uh, Burkholderia cepacea is number one, roughly one third of all objectionable microorganisms. And we also have a lot of yeast and mold, pseudomonas and bacillus cereus. Um, yeah, so you, you can can read through the slide and see some, some examples of other organisms that can be found. And as a short summary or takeaway, we can say that the specified organisms in the Euro European pharmacopoeia are not the only bad organisms. We must always consider different risks when deciding if organism is objectionable or not. Can environmental isolates be objectionable? Yes, absolutely. No doubts about that. For this reason, laboratories should always <clears throat> preserve objectionable environmental organisms for future testing, not only for auditors, but because it is the right thing to do. <clears throat> now, the strain maintenance considerations when it comes to storage and in-house strain maintenance, there are a few things that should be considered. Let's take a look at the short-term preservation. Depending on the preservation method, if it's subculturing, refrigeration, um, or even sub-zero freezing by minus 20 degrees, you definitely see some pros because it's uh, you know low tech, low cost, uh, you can maintain viability if you're freezing up to one year. But there are a lot of disadvantages of these methods. Uh, there is a risk of mutation, definitely, risk of contamination. You will exceed five passages in a few months. And of course, your strains at some point will lose the wild traits. If we're considering freezing, you know, the risks are to have the cellular damage due to ice crystals. Again, the risk of contamination, freezer cost and maintenance. Strain characteristics will change randomly. And there's always a risk of losing the isolate. You know, we, we uh, always say that it is minus 20 is fine for your ice cream, but it's not really good for uh, quality control and, uh, you know, maintenance of the strains. For long-term preservation, um, we can consider methods like ultra-low freezing, cryogenic freezing. Um, the good side is that it reduces probability of mutation. You have longer survival rate, but on the other hand, it's labor intensive, it's more costly. It requires closer uh, monitoring to your temperature. There is always a risk in case of power failure. 
and there is also risk of losing the isolate. Another method that is seen or used sometimes is lyophilization. It reduced, reduces the risk of intracellular ice damage. It stops all chemical reactions and it's an easy storage. But it requires specialized equipment. Uh, lyophilization expertise is also required and it's much more labor intensive. For short and long term, um, an alternative approach of its outsourcing, in other words, giving this job to someone else becomes interesting because here you gain a lot of advantages like accreditation of the contractor, equipment of the contractor, trained staff of the contractor. Uh, for long-term preservation, you have um, lots of options. You have a second physical place for the isolates and you can have your products in ready to use form formats with guaranteed mean assay value, certificate of analysis, and other documentation. There are some um, cons here. Of course, the initial investment it, uh, takes a little bit more uh, in terms of the investment uh, to, to set it up, and it requires trust in the manufacturer. Now let's take a look at what we at Microbiologics can offer to our customers around the world. When we speak of Microbiologics custom solutions, we like to use these three words, your stream, your format, your convenience. And these are not just the words or an advertisement. It is much more than that. It is our company philosophy and our promise to customers, if you will. You give us your stream, really any strains, including the most challenging ones. And we make a ready to use product for you in the format of your convenience, uh, of your choice for your convenience. Now, a few words about the procedure so you understand exactly how this works. First of all, you find and identify a suspected isolate of your interest. Then you would contact our distributor, Lab Consult in Belgium, some information we need to receive from you, like the type of organism, type of culture media used in the lab, and the general growth requirements. Also, we would need to know the frequency of use for this particular strain and the type of product requirement. Let's say a product for GPT or something else. Definitely, uh, if quantitative numbers required, as well as desired concentration, please let us know. In response, Microbiologics will provide quotation for set up cost associated with this work, a regular price per kit for this custom product. Then you as a customer would notify our distributor if you accept the offer and conditions. And then you would send your strain to us by mail. Finally, we manufacture the product to meet your requirements. What we normally do with each strain received is the following. We do 16S sequencing identification, as well as mass spectrometry identification. Manufacturing in ready-to-use format with two years of shelf life. It includes setup cost uh, and four kits of final product. The product is lyophilized, transferred at ambient temperature and storage at two to eight degrees in the refrigerator. Comes in guaranteed concentration, with known standard deviation and certificate of analysis. Also, we provide external storage in our facilities. Four years free strain banking or more, depending on your need. And of course, we manufacture in complete confidentiality. As a short summary, um, we can say that environmental monitoring is a critical concern in pharmaceutical laboratories. We at Microbiologics are the only provider or of custom solutions with affordable pricing, the most convenient formats and superior technical support. Do not hesitate to let us know if there are any questions about our manufacturing process. Same if you would like to audit us. We will be very happy to arrange this for you. Finally, if you have any questions, comments, complaints, or any other types of feedback, or if you would like to place an order of Microbiologics products, please feel free to contact our partner Lab Consult. Here you have all the contact information. 
And um, with this being said, I would like to thank you once again for joining the webinar for your time and attention. I hope this was useful to you. And uh, now I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Andre. Thanks for this uh, very interesting talk and overview of uh, GPT. So there's uh, the possibility now to, to ask uh, some questions to Andre. Um, I don't see anything appearing in the chat yet, so don't be shy if you have any questions about the, the use, the practicality of microbiologics products, just, uh, just shoot, don't be shy. <laughs> If we don't get any um, questions at this stage, um, also just feel free to, to contact us at a later stage uh, at Lab Consult uh, via email um, or phone. We will, uh, we will cover any questions you might have or any technical support you, you might need. We're, we're here to help you. So no questions at this point. Okay. No, I just I just want to mention that this uh, session has been recorded. Um, it's been asked by uh, by someone in the chat before. So the session has been recorded. Uh, after we close this uh, webinar, we'll send an email to all registered attendees with the link to this recording. Um, feel free to share this with uh, other interested people, huh? so colleagues or or students or whoever you you think is interested. Please. Uh, just forward the the link to the the video it's not a problem no i see no questions so i think uh, i think we can conclude at least this this webinar now um i would again like to thank andre for his time and um an effort to uh, to give us this this nice overview of uh, of what they are doing with microbiologics um, I also want to remind all the attendees that um, this is the second webinar of three. The final, first, uh, the final session will be held next week, also the Tuesday at 11 o'clock, so the same time. And then we will have um, Enrico Tatti from Biolog um, tell us something about their technology that they develop for the identification of microorganisms. Mm -hmm. we'll, uh, we'll send you an email with the registration for for that as well um, in the in the coming days uh, and again if you have any other questions about microbiologics please just uh, send us an email yeah. thank you sam and thanks again everyone for attending the webinar please as sam said do not do not hesitate to let us know if you have any any questions about our products or if you'd like to try our product mm -hmm. either commercial available product or customized product let us know if you have any questions or need any information about that. We'll be happy to discuss with you. Yes, thank you. Indeed. Okay. Thank you, Andre. Thanks for your time. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you all for, for joining. See many of you hopefully next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.